Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Good afternoon. Everybody, good afternoon to uh, the last uh, session, the afternoon session at the faculty uh, summit. Um, so this session, I'm going to be very brief to leave plenty of time to our speakers, but this is a session around data and the data-centric fields like machine learning. We have three talks by three different speakers who are all going to um, provide uh, uh, some different uh, aspects on, the, on data, right? So with the first one, with Roger Barger, uh, I'll introduce him in, in a minute. So he will be gi giving us like the business side of uh, how to unleash the power of data. He's at Microsoft. On the second talk, we look uh, more at the research aspect of what does it mean or when you do machine learning and now you are faced with large scale, we're talking really, really large scale data. How does it change the way uh, you need machine learning? And uh, last but not least, most of you here in academia, uh, we will have a talk from somebody from academia from Stanford, uh, Persilian, who will be talking to us about uh, an approach about how to uh, best collaborate and, wh and uh, what's the best way to do that. And he will talk about some of his opinions and the platform, which is done in collaboration, actually, with, with Microsoft. All right, so now we're going to go back to research aspects and looking actually at what it means uh, from a machine learning point of view when we start looking at really, really large scale data sets. And for that, we are very happy to have Leon Boutou with us. Uh, Leon has extensive experience in the topic actually and in uh, actually industry research lab. He worked in ATAT labs and the subsequent labs. Joined Microsoft about three years ago, I believe, and first in actually in one of our business groups, also experience actually in uh, working with large scale data like in our big organization. And with that, I I'll let ah, you, yes. okay, so. It's this one. That's the one. Yeah. So I would like to thank you very much for giving me a chance to talk here. And I would like to say I have too many slides, so let me rush into it. Um, so, okay. So I'm going to start by describing three influential ideas in machine learning. And I say influential because I don't want to say defining, but they're probably the three ideas that define machine learning in the last 20 years. The first one is ID. And it's not ID as a concept, it's ID as a pragmatic thing. At the end of the paper, there is always a situation where you have training data, testing data, and you train on the training data, you test on the testing data, maybe you do cross-validation, but you always assume they follow the same distribution. And this has driven machine learning progress for at least 20 years, and it's probably one of the main factors in progress. The second idea is model selection trade-offs, that when you have an excess error, you can split it as approximation error, which is how much we lose because we're looking for a function in the limited family of function, and estimation error, which is how much we lose because we're using a finite training set. And when you increase the size of the family of function, typically the approximation error decreases, the estimation error increases, and there is some optimum, and you do model selection that way. And the idea here is how complex a model can you afford with your data? And the last one, which is related, is what I call the Vatnik's razor. When solving a learning problem of interest, do not solve a more complex problem as an intermediate step. And again, the idea is how complex a model can you afford with your data, again. So for instance, if you want to learn a classifier, you use a model that outputs a class and nothing else. If you want to do something more complex, you have to carefully define the complex and solve the problem and nothing else, because if you solve something else, you're going to use data for that and you'd be less effective in the end. And these three ideas, you find them in the various currents in machine learning, you find them to various degrees. And uh, there are a couple of no's in this uh, graph, but what you have to see that the no has a little footnote that says that oh, maybe it's no, but maybe it's yes too a little bit. So my goal now is to show that these three ideas fall completely flat when you have large scale data. 
And the first part is the one that's probably the, the best understood, is the large-scale learning trade-off, and I'm going to go fast on that one to spend more time on the other ones. So, uh, okay, I guess you can read the slide. So, so the idea is that uh, a, co a couple years ago, um, uh, people were considering that to, a large-scale problem was mostly an engineering problem. You just had to use a bigger machine, a better optimization algorithm, and these things were not connected. Use the best statistics, the best optimization, and that didn't work that way. But in fact, it's going to be a bit different. So suppose you have a large problem. Optimizing on your training set is costly. And optimizing on the training set is an approximation of finding, for finding the best function in the family of function, which is it's an approximation for finding the best function. So it's already a lot of approximation. So there is no need to optimize that exactly. So suppose you optimize to a level where, to a certain accuracy row on the training set. So when you do this, you add a third term in the decomposition of the error, in addition to how much you lose because you use a finite, a smaller finite function, how much you lose because you use a finite training set, it's how much you lose because you don't optimize perfectly. And the problem is to choose the family of function, number of examples, and accuracy to make this sum as small as possible. And you have constraints, of course. Constraints is the total number of examples you can have and the computing time. So when the constraint that's active is the number of examples, you're in the small scale setup. So when you're in this, in this situation, because you have ample time to reduce the estimation error, you take n as large as possible, as you take all your examples. To reduce the optimization error, you optimize completely, and you're left with adjusting the size of the family of function, which is the model selection trade-off that I discussed at the beginning. Well, in the large-scale case, this is more complicated, because this time, the constraint is the computing time. You have so many examples that what really limits you is the computing time. And the trade-offs are more complex because they depend on everything. They depend on the algorithm as well. For instance, if you choose row smaller, meaning that you optimize more, well, you decrease the optimization error, but in order to fit in the time budget, you either have to consider a family of functions that's simpler or less examples, which has a negative impact on estimation and approximation error. So the trade-off now depends on the optimization algorithm, which means that we can compare optimization algorithms using a different criterion than optimization quality. So computing time, testing error, and the base limit for your problem. If you change the number of examples, typically you get things like this. So basically less example, is, okay. you get the idea. If you change the model or you change the optimizers, you get a collection of curves like this. And of course, if you look at the bottom of the envelope, depending on how much time you have, you're going to choose a different number of examples, a different model, a different optimizer. So if you analyze this in a relatively simple case, fixed family of function, and you compare simple algorithms like gradient descent, second order gradient descent, which means basically Newton, stochastic gradient descent and a combination of the two, and you run the analysis, you find out that uh, the batch algorithms that look at all the data have a time per iteration that grows with the number of examples, while the stochastic algorithm do not have that. The batch algorithm converge much faster to a certain accuracy row, and the Newton is much faster than the simple gradient descent, and the stochastic algorithm seems completely hopeless. But if you add the new line at the bottom, and this new line represents how, if I fix this quantity here, how much time do I need? What you see is that now the stochastic algorithm looks good. And if you run this in practice, well, it's been verified many times, for example, for text categorization, you get things like this, where you go from uh, six hours for plain SVM to 1.4 seconds and get the same kind of results. And the figure that summarizes this is that here you have the optimization accuracy from not very accurate to very accurate. Here the training time, if you take the sophisticated optimization algorithm, is going to give you very high accuracy in very short time. If you take the stochastic algorithm, well, if you want high accuracy, it's hopeless. But by the time you cross and you look at the testing cost, the testing cost saturates long before these two algorithms cross. So running the stochastic algorithm is the better option. And uh, this has been verified many times. And uh, nowadays, there are a lot of more algorithms, a lot better algorithms than stochastic gradient, or the plain stochastic gradient, but they all have this component that you're not going to look at all examples to do a step. So in conclusion, 
From the point of view of model selection, there is a large difference between small scale and large scale. And in particular, you should look at optimization in a rather different way, and you have to look at it in a holistic way. So that was the easy part. The second point I would like to make is a comment about breadth versus accuracy. I'll go back to this curve. We have the optimal base error for our problem, regardless of the feature, regardless of anything, and the testing error. And if I use 1 million examples, I get 8.1% error. Good. And if I use 10 million examples, I get 8.01. 100 million examples, 8.001. Well, at some point, you know, we should choose another problem because uh, the accuracy improvement cannot justify the computational cost forever. So why, why do you use a very large training set for these kind of things? Should we use large training sets for learning? Is it really the problem? So let's look at it differently. Let's consider zip distributed data. We know that roughly half the search query, half the distinct search query are unique, regardless of how long the period you look at. You look for one month, half of them are unique. You look for one week, half of them are unique. And if you sort your queries in frequency order, so you have the very frequent one and the not very frequent one, and you do something per query, there is a point where you don't have enough data to learn. So in the green part, you can learn correctly. In the red part, it's pretty much random. Now, suppose you double the size of your set. So when you double the size of your set, you double what you see in the head, pretty much. So you see a lot more of the common ones, and you see a lot more of the tail. So now, because you have a lot more examples, you'll be able to learn up to that point somehow. The change in average accuracy is ridiculous. It's very small. It's the 8.1 to 8.01. But the change in number of uh, situations, number of queries for which you give the good answer is large. So what you see is that if you look at the average error, you have diminishing return. It seems hopeless. If you look at the number of queries for which you can learn the correct answer, doubling the data set, gave a very large increase. So if you want to use large scale, you should, of course, look at the scenario in which the returns are not diminishing. The more data you have, the more you gain. And then we have a problem. So uh, accuracy improvements are subject to diminished returns, average accuracy. Breath improvements are not subject to diminished returns. And uh, it's not how accurately do we recognize an object category. It's how many categories do we recognize well enough. And then you have two different point of view. You have the scientist says, should we optimize a different criterion? Seems very attractive to optimize something that actually can benefit from data. And you have the business guys, how does this help if average accuracy is what they care about? The dollars, they're the average, you know, they're not the, the breadth. Well, the business guy is wrong, is wrong. First question is, how example identically distributed really? In traditional machine learning, for a real problem, if you experience that, you know that collecting the data set that's representative is the hardest part. It's a lot of work to get a nice data set for your problem. The ID assumption is not automatic. It's hard work. Now, if you're in a big data setup, big data exists because the data collection is automated. There is no manual curation. You shouldn't expect ID. In fact, it's much worse in general you're going to use the data to make decision, and your decision is going to shift the data distribution anyway. So you can't count on ID. So look at the distribution. X is the input, Y the output. Let's suppose it's a classification. Y are the classes, X the patterns. You write it as P of Y given X times P of X. P of Y given X, you hope it's relatively constant because this is what you want to model. If you want to model something that's changing all the time, you're in trouble. So P of X is going to change. Meaning that if you look in terms of queries, the queries from last month are not the same of the queries from next month. So if you minimize the training set error, well, the approximation errors, they push towards the patterns X with low probability in the training set. And what if these patterns occur more frequently at testing time because you have a shift? So a robust approach to this problem, to try to robust this kind of uh, shifts, is to not optimize the average error but try to maximize the diversity of the patterns that are recognized well enough. And there are various ways to see this uh, problem. And uh, uh, one of the interesting side effects of this stuff is that if you decide that you don't want to optimize for average accuracy, 
you want to optimize the domain in which, the size of the domain in which you're working well enough. Well, look at your data. In the green, you have enough data to train. In the red, you cannot anyway. But on the head, all this data, that's most of the data, you don't really need it. If, if you want to optimize the average accuracy, you're going to work very hard to model the head very well. But the basic of, basis of this idea is to say, as soon as my system works well enough, I don't need more data. So most of the data is something you can discard. So at any time, what you want to do is filter the data to work, to keep enough data for what you already know, to maintain what you already know, but also uh, use data that's just at the border to, of what you know in order to, to, to increase the size of the domain you, uh, you want to know. You, you know. you know sufficiently well. And uh, this is very interesting because it connects to the idea of curriculum learning, which proved very effective in a number of large-scale problems. It's also very interesting because this offers scalability gains across the board. You know, filtering the data, that's easy. You can do it in parallel. You don't need complicated loops. You don't need very high-performance clusters. So it's not clear that if you want to train something for that purpose, you need huge computing power in a very dense cluster. Maybe you can do it in a way that's much more smart. Now, my last point is about uh, trying to undo the, the Vapnik razor, about deep learning and transfer learning. And I'm just going to go back in history because deep learning is an old idea. So in the mid-90s, we were trying to engineer machine learning system to do, for instance, uh, uh, check amount reading. And uh, that was with Jan Lequin, Joshua was here, and a couple other people. The input X is a scan check image. And the computer was small, so that was large data for the time. The output is a positive number with two decimals, just the amount. Now, if you just use pairs of X, Y, you're in trouble, because maybe it's possible to train a full system with just check images and amount, but at that time, it was certainly not possible given our computing budget. So what we do is that we split the problem. We identify sub-problems like locate the amount field on your check, segment characters in amount field, recognize isolated characters, translate character strings into an amount, which is not always obvious because uh, you, know, you have crazy amounts with stars and stuff like that. Then you define a sub-model for each sub-problem and uh, fairly complicated recognition models, they were convolutional networks, actually, uh, highly engineered location and segmentation models with only a few adjustable thresholds, you collect and label data for each sub-problem. There's a lot of manual work, but you know, manual work is not that expensive, even at that time. And then you have various training strategies. You can do independent training. You train each sub-model separately. You put them together. It sort of works. You can do sequential training. You label the output of a sub-model, and you train the next one, which somehow you learn how to correct for the previous one. You can do global training, where you pre-train in one of these previous ways, and then when you have a model that already works quite well, you train on big examples of check and label with very weak labeling. Now, there are a number of issues to do this. It's complicated, but it actually works. And it's worked well enough to process, uh, I think, about 15% of the checks in the US for at least 10 or 15 years. So, so these kind of things work. Now, in the recent years, we had some ideas on deep learning, and at least the one excellent idea is to pre-train with sequential unsupervised learning. So instead of engineering the model and defining sub-problems that make sense to us, you just create a sequence of sub-models and train them unsupervised with no particular criterion. And then you tune with global training and it works very well. And that was a surprise for me. The surprise is that, uh, well, uh, engineering learning system is much easier than we thought. We don't need to think so hard about the sub-problems, or maybe we do, but not as hard. We don't need to label specific data uh, by hand. Uh, simple tasks like unsupervised learning go a long way to getting our problem to be completely solved. Unsupervised learning. I'm always surprised about unsupervised learning because intuitively I don't trust it, and here is why. The Prototype of unsupervised learning is clustering. So what is a cluster? Well, it's an assumption basically that the shape of the density reveals the underlying categories. 
that because you have a hole there, you're going to somehow have categories that make sense. Now, the problem is that if you change the input space, for instance, if I squeeze the points here and I erase them a little bit, and I could that by changing the input space, so applying a continuous function to my input space. Like, for instance, when you have images, we have all these nice squares, uh, grids of pixels, but you know, in eyes, they're not square. So the, the, the actual features, there is no reason why they should be a square grid and with this kind of linear intensity and RGB. So when you change and you, the input space, you can perfectly well make the cluster disappear, even though the classes still remain. So clustering revisited, clustering is the expression of the prior knowledge that we encode in the choice of our input representation. So unsupervised learning is pretty much the same as saying that we have really cheap labels X1 and X2 are closed or are not closed in the geometry we have chosen for our patterns. It's not, so in fact, what we have is auxiliary tasks. If you look at the tasks that are possible, some tasks are qualified as interesting. And interesting means that the label data is scarce because if the label data was abundant, that wouldn't be a problem and you, the task wouldn't be that interesting. And the observation that in the vicinity of an interesting task with expensive labels, there are often less interesting tasks with cheap labels that we can put to good use. And unsupervised learning is just one of them with trivial labels that arise from our choice of representation. So when you look at it that way, deep learning, semi-supervised learning, transfer learning, there's just three facets of the same thing. Examples. Face recognition. It's an interesting problem. You have an image, you want to see who this is. Uh, it's not so easy to get a thousand labeled image for each person. But there is a related but less interesting problem is to take two images of faces and say whether this is the same person or not. And for this, you have lots of data. If you have a picture and two faces, they're different people, except for twins and mirrors, but you can quantify that. And if you have frames, faces in successive frames of a movie, they're likely to be the same person. Not always, but at least you can quantify it. You have noisy labels, but they're there. So you can build a system where the faces are transformed in some features, and then there is a comparison. And you train this, and you have plenty of data. Then you have a good feature extractor. You take this feature extractor, you plug a very simple classifier, you get your answer, and you did what? One, two examples to train? That's enough. Another example is natural language tagging. tagging. So that's the work of Ronan Colobert, Jason Weston, and uh, other people. Uh, we're looking at standard natural language processing tagging tasks, like uh, path of speech and identity recognition. And the related but less interesting problem is uh, uh, a problem where you try to say whether a sentence appears in Wikipedia or not or at least a segment of a sentence. And what you do is that you take a sentence, and sometimes you change the middle word. When you change the middle word, you want the score to be less than when you have the original one. When you train this, you can learn a word representation that proves to be very useful for all these tasks. So if we look back to Vapnik's razor, ah, the idea was uh, to solve directly the problem of interest and not to solve a more difficult problem as an intermediate step because well, how complex a model can we afford with our data? The fact is that we have plenty of data with different value, and sometimes solving a more complex task for which we have a lot of data and transferring features or transferring hidden state or transferring layers or whatever allows us to leverage more data in, of a different nature. And this has a lot of implication, not only on deep learning as it's done today, but our deep learning how it's going to be done in the future. So my conclusion is that large scale changes everything and that we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't feel bound by the usual dogmas of machine learning. It's going to be difficult because the idea that the training set and the testing set and you can make experiments and everything is a very powerful idea, but it's not a dogma. It's not something that we should consider as completely frozen. It's not anymore. So it's a very interesting time because we're free to think in different terms and also a very dangerous time because uh, people are expecting a lot from us and uh, the landscape has shifted in such a way that we have to invent a lot of new things. And that's my conclusion. Right, thank you. <laughs> Questions for Leon? <laughs> 
when you formalize... Hold on a second, we need the mic so that people can hear it when they see the video later. Thank you. So I'm, uh, I find very interesting your idea of uh, uh, the depth, the breadth is something you want to uh, optimize rather than the average uh, error. Can you, have you thought about formalizing this a bit more? I know many ways to formalize it. I'm not sure which one is best. So the issue is that here I presented it in terms of number of distinct queries. Now you can understand that in another domain where you have a continuous features, you cannot count them so easily. So somehow... Or there you know, may be many ways in which you can categorize your data and count different ways. Yes, and so somehow the way you count them is an anticipation of the kind of coverage shifts you're expecting. So the goal here is to try to develop something that's robust to coverage shift. And the way to, I suggest to do it is uh, uh, by playing a game on the distributions. But I don't want to say much more than this at this point. I just want to say that we have to think about this very seriously. Any other question? Here, please. So in the second part, you mentioned the different kinds of queries, and some are very frequent, and you probably don't need, need really do that, that much learning. Some are at the tail. That's where we need help. And do you think you can leverage the structure of the data to actually help the tail query part? Because you, you didn't elaborate on your point there. Okay. It seems that there's not that much we can do to that part, but that's where it matters, right? So oh, okay. there are connections between queries. They share the same words. And there may be other structures that you can leverage that the structure part of the data. Um, let, me, actually, let me continue what you have in mind. You're thinking maybe with smart features I can connect the tail queries to the head queries and I'm going to learn on the head and uh, generalize to the tail. But regardless of what you do with features, when you look at the feature space, the features you have chosen, you're always going to a space where you have a lot of data and space where you don't have enough data to learn. So you just shifted the problem by doing this. Of course, you can shift it in a smart way. It can be useful, but it's still there. Yeah, so the, the opportunity is still there. Right. The problem is they exist, but it's possible to have the features that, um, that are generalizable to the, um, to the tail part. So, for example, if you just learn how to combine different ways to score um, documents, maybe that same way it doesn't necessarily translate from one query to another query because they need to emphasize different uh, uh, strategies, for example, navigational queries tend to maybe uh, gain more from link analysis like page rank, but informational queries may need a more weight on content matching. So that strategy doesn't uh, transfer because of the features defined at a high level. I understand. Yeah. My answer is that you can do feature engineering and it's going to help, but it's no, not going uh, to uh, make this problem disappear. Yeah, so my question is, uh, can you actually learn the features, for example, deep learning or other strategies to, to That's learn features? Uh, the so the learning part. Yeah. The deep learning part. We should learn yeah, the, the feature, and to learn the feature, we don't have only the task at hand, but we have plenty of other tasks for which we might have cheap labels, cheaper labels. Yeah, so the word translation relations um, can potentially be uh, transferred from the head queries to the tail queries, for example, car is related to vehicle, and that knowledge can be potentially acquired yes, from the tail, um, head queries. Regardless of the feature engineering you do, whether they learn or not learn, you're still going to have the same problem because once you've learned the feature, you find your nice features. When you look at the space, you're still going to have domains that are where you have a lot of data and domains where you have very little, and sometimes the domain where you have very little are going to be those important in the future. Yeah, so I agree. Uh, the so, so the, the problem still exists. I just exist. have a question about the, whether you can leverage the structure. I, I try in, to uh, decouple the two problems uh, in, in the presentation, but you, solving one doesn't solve the other one. You displace it. You don't solve it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you, Leon. Okay, so the last talk of this session is given by Percy Lian from uh, Stanford uh, University. Uh, Lian, uh, Percy, sorry, Percy joined, <laughs> has joined Stanford actually in September. Before that, uh, uh, he did uh, his training PhD at MIT and Berkeley. 
Uh, today he's going to give actually a talk which is very different from his uh, research, the, the research, research he's doing. Um, and uh, it's going to focus actually on the, another facet of data-centric uh, re, uh, research and uh, uh, how machine learning, how it plays a role there in the context of the community. And with that, Percy, I'll let you go okay. there. Okay, thanks Evelyn for having me. I'm, thanks everyone for coming. Like Evelyn said, this is a different talk than I usually give, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so this talk will have a lot of similarities infrastructurally to what Roger talked about earlier, but I'm going to focus more on the uh, research side of things. And in particular, my goal is to really build tools that enable researchers to be more productive. Okay, so let's start by thinking about you know, the current research process, and I'm going to highlight some of the issues I think we can really try to improve on. Um, so let's start with idea. So research is, you know, I, in, in some sense, should be about this, right? So come up, coming up with good ideas and, uh, you know, kind of be able to test them out. But that's kind of only one piece of it. So anyone who has done research knows that, you know, step two involves finding data, cleaning it, converting between formats, and then you have to compare with other people's code. So you go find their code, it doesn't compile, so you email the authors, and then, you know, you, uh, you give up and re-implement re the whole thing. You run a code, and of course it gets uh, different results, uh, often worse, and you have to run all these experiments and keep track of it. So we like to somehow focus um, people's attention on step one and make step two as uh, easy and clean as possible. Um, second point is that uh, the issue of non-exhaustive comparison. So you read a paper, and usually it looks like something like this. Uh, previous method gets 88%, our method gets uh, 92%, and um, on some data sets, and if it's a good paper, then it'll try another data set and show consistent results. But then you, you, know, you wonder, what about data set number three, and what about all these other data sets which uh, the paper obviously didn't uh, report results on? Right? So, uh, another point, which is related, is you read a paper and you have this uh, result. Well, if you think about you know, science and you know, controlled experiment, you, know, you ask the question, what is responsible for this difference? And you read the, the, kind of the paper and there's actually many things that could probably be uh, going on, you, different types of um, optimization algorithms, different models, completely different kind of setup, and of course, and, you know, you have different bugs in each one. So, I mean, maybe that's what's uh, driving it all. So you really would like to be able to tease this part because, I mean, as part of research, we have to be kind of scientific and rigorous. Okay, so uh, yet another one is um, just the lack of a broad overview. Right, so if you ask me what kind of algorithms work well on what types of data sets. You know, I've been in this field for some amount of time, but I can't really give you a kind of a crisp answer. I can give you kind of general, you know, this, uh, you know, uh, linear classifiers tend to work on sparse, uh, you know, data and, you know, various uh, neural nets tend to work on these other types of kind of uh, image and um, speech data, but I can't really give you anything um, concrete. So. Um, I think, and let me draw an analogy. So the analogy is, you know, what the kind of the world map looked like in uh, circa 1500s, right? So people had a rough idea of kind of things in Europe, but you know, if you look over here, uh, it, we think South America. I mean, Brazil is an, an island, and so on. So um, this is something that I think is, um, you know, important to fix. And related to this, so now that uh, unfortunately all these slides are cut off, but um, let me see if I can, I'll just put it there. It'll, it'll look a little uglier, but that's, at least you can see the whole thing. Um, so now that machine learning has become so pervasive, I mean, I'm kind of astounded of, you know, you know, even at this kind of conference, how many times the word machine learning has been uh, mentioned. And I think it's a, you know, uh, responsibility to try to um, make machine learning kind of research more uh, clear in some sense. So from an outsider's perspective, you know, um, what are even the, the problems um, in the field? And also, what are the solutions? We have a lot of kind of words, but we need some uh, systematic way of cataloging and seeing how things relate to each other empirically. Okay, so, so my objective really t is to uh, build, we want to build a collaborative ecosystem for conducting computational research. Mostly I'm focusing on machine learning and AI related problems, but this is kind of more general than that. 
uh, for conducting research in an efficient and reproducible manner. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about two projects, uh, um, one in ML Comp, which I worked on in grad school, and Coda Lab, which I'm currently working on in collaboration with uh, MSR. Okay, and these are going to get at different aspects of the whole host of problems that I uh, mentioned earlier. So ML Comp is about stands for machine learning comparison, so you can kind of guess what it's trying to do. And um, you know, in the world, there's uh, two types of people. Um, there's people with uh, programs um, who come in and say, I have this brand shiny new hammer, and you know, how does my work uh, compare to others? Because then I can say in my paper, my algorithm works better. Um, and then there's people with uh, data sets or problems, and they want to know, they just want what is the best method for my problem. And ML Comp is kind of a way to bring these people together so that each person gets what they want. Okay, so what are the, just diving in a little bit deeper, what are the kind of the components? There's the idea of programs, for example, this SVM implementation, there's data sets, and then uh, a run, which is basically taking a program on a data set and producing some metrics. Okay, so it's extremely simple. At this, uh, I'm hiding some other details, but conceptually, it's exactly this. So how does a, a website work? Um, users come along, they upload some programs, uh, users can, other users can upload data sets, and on the system, uh, runs the programs on the data set, right? So everything is kind of happening in a distributed and asynchronous manner. So conceptually, what you can think about this is building out a huge uh, matrix. So this matrix has programs and data sets uh, as the axes, and each entry corresponds to a result, maybe accuracy or error rate. Right, so as, and the goal is to kind of fill in this matrix. So now when I have a new data set, what I'm doing is adding a column and I can run you know, a whole host of programs on this uh, data set and see which one works the best. And correspondingly, I can, if I have a new program, I can run it on all the data sets that people actually cared about because they uploaded it and you know, get a very comprehensive uh, benchmark. So, so that's kind of the idea. And if you're wondering, you know, of course you can't run any program on any data set, this is one slice of a larger tensor. So this is for, say, binary classification, you have something like this. For other um, problems like sequence tagging, you would have different uh, matrices. Okay, so let me say one word uh, about generalization. So as in machine learning, we think a lot about generalization from the training set to the test set, but this is kind of at a meta level, which I think uh, gets uh, just um, omitted. So you have a bunch of data sets and programs which come along. Um, and evaluation, you take a program, you run on a data set, and you get some accuracy. And I, I want to stress that this is, in some sense, should be only meaningful when the data set isn't uh, dependent on the program. Because if a program uh, was constructed based on this data set, there might be kind of subtle overfitting issues. But of course, in papers, this is uh, never true because the author took the data set and they ran at their program and they you know, saw what it was. Um, so what's kind of interesting in ML Comp, it allows you to do this kind of blind experiment um, by virtue of running things in the cloud. So if people upload a program, and then separately people are going to upload new data sets after, um, and by virtue of being afterwards, these are you know, going to be, I mean, unless it was the same guy who uploaded these data sets, I mean, in general, it's going to be independent of uh, the program. And that provides, these new data sets provide a much more objective evaluation of that program. Okay, um, just so, some of key design decisions, so because this is an actual website, not just an idea, it exists, you can go to it. Um, we want to make this as uh, low barrier to entry as possible because everyone has their own favorite way of kind of uh, um, writing code, um, you know, but at the same time, people have to conform to various standards, and we have a fixed uh, set of kind of interfaces that people um, code to. Um, and currently, um, all runs are executed in the cloud. And importantly, any users can download uh, programs, data sets, and runs and reproduce it on their local machine um, as long as it's not marked as restricted access. Okay. So uh, just a little brief uh, detour about what else is out there, right? So there's obviously code and data repositories, um, which are kind of static repositories with only code and data. Um, there's a machine learning as a service is becoming a very big uh, thing these days. Um, but they, they kind of focus on providing 
you know, machine learning as a service. You have a fixed uh, set of programs which are believed to be really good, and then people submit their data, and uh, you know, they get some predictions, and they walk away, right? So this doesn't uh, exactly help the, the algorithm designers get uh, better algorithms because you know, the, everything's kind of siloed off. And on the other hand, you have uh, competitions like Kaggle, which in some sense is the, the reverse. They provide a set of data sets. People come with different programs and upload their predictions of those programs. Uh, but generally, you get these solutions which are targeted towards data sets, and you, la you lose that generalization. So by, I think, really focusing on both of the data set and code axes and getting that matrix, you really kind of force people to uh, think more generally. OK, so what's the status? So uh, this is, I guess, now kind of an older project. Um, started with uh, some of my colleagues at Berkeley. Um, today, there's some number of uh, 2,000 users, some hundreds of data sets and programs. Um, the website is up. Everything's open source, so you can go check it out. OK, so what am I doing on time? I feel like I'm going fast. but um, So next, I'm going to talk about uh, Coda Lab, which is this new effort and to address some of the things that uh, MLComp was uh, deficient in. And the idea is, you know, MLComp was uh, kind of very simple. You take a program and take a data set, you run it, and you get some number, right? But we all know that, you know, things aren't as simple as that. So often in learning, you want to, even at this basic level, you want a fuller analysis. You want to dive in and say, how sensitive is this program to a bunch of the parameters, like the learning rate, the, the regularization term, the choice of um, you know, kernel or whatever? Um, and how f sensitive is it to, you know, you want learning curves, you want uh, kind of not just a single number, but you want kind of the whole curve of um, you know, confidences, confusion matrices, you want to look at the individual predictions, and furthermore, you want to visualize all of this in some nice way, right? So MLComp currently doesn't really support this. It gives you some uh, set of metrics. And importantly, this is not something, we can, you know, code this all up and put it in MLComp, but it's the idea is that these are things that are kind of more open-ended and um, can't be just captured in just a set of uh, five things. Um, and the second kind of motivation for wanting something else uh, other than MLComp is, you know, I work in natural language processing, and uh, which is, I think of as a, quote, AI problem, and same with kind of uh, vision and uh, some other problems, is that these require, you know, uh, complex, these type of problems require complex workflows. It's not just taking one data set and just doing some, uh, prediction and then we're done, right? And I'll give you kind of an example of this. So in text understanding, you want to take you know long passages um, and you know try to understand the content and be able to answer questions, right? So this is an example from uh, taken from a medical uh, exam. Um, of course, it would, I don't think any system can do this right now, but it's you know it's a stretch goal. Um, so if you wanted to do even something remotely close to this, you need to build some sort of uh, you know, there are a lot of components, right? Um, so even starting with basic issues with breaking up the sentence into words. So in, for example, in Chinese, you don't know what the word boundaries are. Um, you need to tag the identify nouns, verbs, you know, the who's, um, what are the named entities, you know, you need to find structures, um, figure out where if uh, pronouns are referring to what other entities in the sentence or maybe more globally and figure out how everything's kind of uh, related, which are the subjects and objects and how everything's related, right? And so this is just the beginning to get to a basic level. And furthermore, each of these components, you know, involve other source of information. So part of speech tagging usually comes by, you know, taking some raw text and clustering, um, and there's kind of a lot of different uh, sources that come in. And of course, there's more that fits on the slides, but the point is that there you have this graph. Okay, so, so how do we deal with this uh, typical use case um, in kind of a new system? Well, there's kind of three principles I want to uh, stress. Um, the first is modularity, right? So, um, you know, it's clear that these kind of AI problems are going to require, you know, the global efforts of the community, and it's not going to be someone in their basement just like writing, you know, a million lines of code and it'll be done. Um, so, 
And, and I think what happens is you know, people will specialize and contribute to this kind of endeavor in a decentralized way. So kind of pictorially, you can see a bunch of these modules, uh, people kind of contributing different modules, and you know, everything's kind of happening in a, a decentralized way. So this is kind of um, a cartoon of how we might imagine the development process to go. Okay, and um, what's kind of interesting about this now, this graph, this graph is going to kind of come up several times in the remaining slides, um, is that, you know, if I'm working on this uh, part of speech tagger right there, right, so how do I, you know, evaluate? Well, I can evaluate on part of speech accuracy, but, you know, that's, so oh, who cares about, I mean, why do I care about part of speech accuracy? So I can also try to you know, argue in the paper why part of speech tagging is important and so on. But we really want something a little bit more uh, systematic. We, what we like to do, I mean, is to swap in this uh, part of speech tagger with my new fancy thing and see all the ramifications downstream. Right? So this is something that you know, would enable people who with kind of uh, very little infrastructure, so I'm, it doesn't take much work to work on like part of speech tagging, to evaluate how their system would impact, for example, with giant machine translation systems or you know, speech recognition systems. And you might take another module and try to see what its downstream impact is. So this provides a way of kind of end-to-end -end evaluation in an uh, automatic way without kind of the overhead of each individual kind of research group setting up their own system. So, I mean, imagine you have uh, this kind of collective ecosystem where these modules kind of interoperate. Um, you know, an analogy is kind of like the internet. And um, so for the, the benefits are kind of at two levels. One is the, in, at the individual level, you avoid duplicate work, right? If you're just plugging in here, you don't need to reproduce everything that someone else has uh, done. And furthermore, that gives you reproducibility. And furthermore, um, in this kind of ecosystem, you produce a new result. If it's doing well, then it will be easy for people to see, aha, this is a great tool. Why don't I use it and you know, continue? Um, and it will give more kind of attention to the better tools. And at a community level, I think this actually increases the pace of innovation because um, you can either serially com combine the modules, um, as I've talked about before, or as we've uh, kind of learned throughout um, the last few years is that the really good way to get uh, accurate predictions is to take ensembles up in parallel of different kind of modules and put them together. And this is all kind of possible in this uh, um, ecosystem. Right, so the principle of number two is kind of immutability. And this is kind of in, draws inspiration from version control systems. Um, the idea is that, well, if everyone is kind of uh, collaborating and adding to this graph, I mean, isn't it going to get completely out of control? And the idea is that, well, every program data set and run is a new node. So it's kind of write once. And this allows us to um, you know, not step on each other's toes, but at, least, uh, and, but at the same time contribute. And furthermore, it also captures the research process in a, in a reproducible way. So we can see the evolve, evolution of kind of the research community as it kind of in, um, improves the tools over time. And the third point I want to make is on uh, literacy. So before I talked about kind of ML comp, and even so far, we've been thinking about what is true. You know, this program gets this accuracy on this data set. We have a, a bunch of different. Uh, we have a whole host of numbers, right? Now we're going to have this huge graph. But the question is, you know, what, what does it all mean, right? So, um, and this is about interpretation. And uh, so here I'm drawing some inspiration from Mathematica and IPython. And the idea is that we want to be able to interleave um, this kind of more formal specification with uh, text descriptions, right? So, and this is we know we do in papers where we describe uh, what and motivate our findings. So imagine something like this, where we say, now we're going to train a classifier. You, you know, put this module there, and then you write some more stuff. Um, and this kind of continues, so it's kind of a self-documenting uh, um, paradigm. And this could be used for a number of different things. Um, one other aspect I want to mention is the uh, opportunity to do uh, meta research, right? So now imagine we have this work, complicated workflow graph, which is constructed now kind of uh, um, 
semi-automatically. So now you can actually take this graph and you know, do further analysis on it. Right? So there's big questions about you know, what kind of methods work for what kind of data sets, which I think can only be answered at looking at across a wide range of uh, things that currently it doesn't exist in one place. Um, so there's a bunch of related projects, I think, in the interest of time. I'll just uh, you know, sk uh, skip over that. Um, so let me talk about some of the two challenges. One is that you know, is uh, people, there's a lot of inertia. So everyone has their favorite way of uh, setting up their environment and using it. Um, so what's important for, I think, these projects is to make it as easy to contribute. Imagine just dragging and dropping your program in whatever format and being able to uh, use um, it for execution. Right? And I think the, the benefits of online sharing, as we've seen in kind of some other domains with like photo sharing or uh, Dropbox, um, is I think going to hopefully outweigh the, the kind of initial barrier of entry. And you can think about this as like really Dropbox plus execution. Um, and once all this uh, data kind of comes into one place, we need a way to you know, f search and filter. And there's, uh, we're kind of building into the initial system, thinking really hard about how to uh, make the, the user be able to find what he wants quickly. OK, so what's the status? So this is, like I said before, a collaboration with uh, um, MSR. And uh, there's a number of people which are, I have to think for kind of making this really kind of happen. But it's still a work in progress. Uh, maybe in a few um, m weeks or months, uh, we'll hear more about this. Um, so if, just final remarks. You know, we're trying to build this collaborative platform. It's, you know, provide, uh, hopefully we'll provide some value to researchers. And I think a lot of these ideas you know, are still kind of being sorted out, so I would kind of encourage you guys to give feedback and you know, suggestions. And if you're interested in getting involved, uh, please come talk to me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so as Percy mentions, questions and also solutions to some of yeah. the challenges. <laughs> Just a yeah. second. Works? Yes. So this is a question for actually both of you, Roger and Percy. Um, so in about one particular slide of my talk too, which has the engineering machine learning systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have three ways to combine machine learning systems. You have separate training, where you train each module separately. You have sequential training, when you train each module on the output of the previous ones, which might involve relabeling. And you have global training, which is to train everything together, which assumes that you have a way somehow to uh, quote, quote, backpropagate derivatives in the system. And I'm very interested, and OK, uh, the third one works better than the second one, which was better than the first one. So I'm curious to know if you have uh, uh, ideas to support such scenarios. Yeah, so, so definitely um, joint training is uh, very important to get uh, good accuracy. I think one of the challenges kind of working in this at the systems level rather than the level of uh, equations is that you know, I want to take your module and jointly train it with you know, my module, which I developed for a different case. And I think there are, uh, we've thought about ways of uh, setting up the interface so you can pass uncertainty into my model. And think about, the, I mean, at the conceptual level, techniques like, um, you know, in some sense, you know, dual decomposition uh, ideas kind of allow you to decouple problems into two and have kind of each one do inference uh, separately and then have ways of passing messages uh, together. So, but retraining. Yeah, so that can, um, if, so if you have a messages kind of, um, you know, modules arranged in series, you know, you get some downstream signal, these messages can be back propagated as well. Other question? <coughs> Pollutions? Oh, okay, so here now. The mic is coming. Do you have any 
even preliminary demos or screenshots of Coda Lab so we can get a sort of a feel for what it actually, sort of what is the feel of the user experience because a lot of these are very high level ideas that, that, that I think we can all agree on in terms of good intentions. But, but in these, with tools like these, the devil is unfortunately in the details in terms of how does it actually work uh, and, and what the experience looks like? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so for ML Comp there, it's running live and you can see it. For Coda Lab, um, Currently, there's, uh, I can't give a demo right now, um, but I think very shortly there will be something. And it's open source, so I think our goal is to make the uh, development tr uh, process transparent so you can go to GitHub and check it out. Um. Me again, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry about ID. So at least in MLComp, it's very based on the ID that you have a training set, testing set, you can trust the result. Uh, in the practical world, it's not like that. And it's turned out that training set, testing set might be the best thing that you have, but you don't want a single number. You want to uh, characterize it by a lot of other things about, uh, you don't want a number, you want to know how the number was produced in order to evaluate how robust this is and yeah. how it's going to react to possible changes. Mm -hmm. In the case where you have a, a, a feedback loop, you have the problem of evaluation and reinforcement learning where you want randomized data in a certain way and a relatively sophisticated evaluation methods. And again, I'm curious to know if you have time to comment about these particular problems. Yeah, so, um, so, so definitely one of the ch changes going from MLCOM to CoderLab is supporting more uh, deeper analytics and not just getting a number and be able to draw uh, learning curves. And I think all of those can kind of be um, you know, the idea, something I didn't talk about, is uh, being able to set up these kind of um, standard templates where you want certain, you know, ROC curves or whatever, and make them kind of macros which you can kind of consistently apply. Um, regarding the question about uh, evaluate, I mean, reinforcement learning, I think is a trickier one. Um, one way that, so, you know, part of MLComp, in deep in, if you delve deep enough, actually does provide support for that kind of uh, training, where, remember, these are just, you know, programs running on data. I mean, it's, you know, it's, so it's very generic. So if you set up, if you want to set up a kind of reinforcement learning environment where you have kind of a, a environment talking to a learner and sending out signals, you can, um, you know, you can do that. And in fact, on MLComp, there's an online learning kind of a, a domain where the learner communicates to this kind of host in and you know they get messages that way. Yeah. So one of, one of the most interesting things about Kaggle is the amount of hand-holding that goes into setting up the competitions and the contests, right? So where is the human in the loop in these efforts? I mean, I, I think we need an army of machine learning, you know, enthusiasts who can handhold some of these, uh, you know, data sets, uh, setting up the frameworks and so on. So so I think unless we are very careful about putting the human in the loop and ensuring that uh, we have that you know each of these frameworks has that same depth of uh, human touch in in explaining the problem, understanding the problem, envisioning the solution to that problem. Uh, I think we are doomed for some very bad failures. <laughs> that's, just, that's just my comment. But if you can address some of that, yeah. So so I definitely um, one of the things I was trying to highlight with the uh, documentation and that kind of literate programming is that, you know, when you go to uh, one of these sites, you don't want to just see, you know, some, you know, data and the, some numbers, right? In Kaggle, if you go to leaderboards, I mean, leaderboards are, um, I mean, from a scientific point of view, they don't offer anything. Did you see numbers and you don't know kind of what the, the methods were, but the idea is to, um, you know, have this system of modules and you can go into each module and see how things are connected and people um, will have written kind of how insights into uh, the different modules. So I'm, I guess part of this was, um, you know, I'm not advocating kind of a completely automatic way to approach to machine learning, right? Where you just upload your data set and bam, you get back the results. Um, but this is hopefully, supposed to automate things that you would have done manually. So if you actually were going to run these five programs and, you know, in manually one by one, you know, this can help you do it in one click, right? But it's not going to replace any kind of brain cells. Okay, last question. So 
I can see this uh, can be a very useful service. Um, I wonder if you um, could comment on uh, two things. One is, uh, do you think that this can potentially evolve into a more sophisticated uh, workbench for doing more uh, research on machining? And this is actually tied to uh, Neon's question earlier, I think. About, uh, can, you, can you, for example, feed some of the output as features together with some other data, just manipulate the data, generate the derived data set that can simulate some of the strategies uh, so that you can, you can turn this into a workbench where you can do yeah. more analysis. I think you, you mentioned analysis. Just yeah, I so think the, the intention is to turn it into, I mean, a workbench. I mean, even f from the, the get-go is that you have these, you know, if you have intermediate uh, kind of uh, modules, you want to be able to plug them in. And um, and all the all the visualization, you know, everything is just you know code running on you know data, right? So one of the visualizations would be a module that allows you to like generate graphs from the the raw data and so on. So yeah. So the uh, then the uh, question here is uh, how do you handle the interfaces among all these different modules and right. So I mean, I think the way, uh, way to think about this is, you know, this this is in some sense providing an operating system, right? And someone, I mean, the operating system is kind of general, but at some point you you need the programs that run, right? So in some sense, we decouple this. Uh, you know, don't worry about kind of versioning and systems issues. Just focus on writing these modules, and then hopefully, uh, as a community, if the number of modules increases, then you'll be able to kind of do things with it. So the second thing is, do you envision this will be connected to literature search and just connect uh, some of the relevant content in literature to the, the results here? Yeah, de definitely. So one thing I actually didn't talk about, and I'm kind of surprised I didn't talk about, is uh, the notion of, kind of, well, I think it was on one of the slides, is this idea of an executable paper, right? So when you read a paper, uh, I guess in the first stage, I hope that, you know, there will be you know, tiny URL links uh, in the figures that click directly into the site, and you can see, well, these were the, the results that backed this figure, and you can you know, delve into the data rather than just like squinting at one of those tiny figures. That, um, um, and uh, stage two, I think, is a little bit more uh, uh, kind of forward-looking is, you know, there's no reason why you know, papers have to be restricted to you know, a PDF file, right? So you can imagine, you know, with these worksheets, you know, creating these executable papers where you have code and data um, kind of in the same place. All right, with that, we're going to close this session and uh, thank again our speakers.